They're interested in connecting for the long term. Often they're interested in connecting with a, a bright researcher all the way from early postdoc years through to retirement. We see this very much from industries. Industries will want to, to look at the university and say, well, that there's a, there's a generation there of people that we would like to interact with. Hello, and welcome to the Strategic Partnerships podcast series. My name is Sarah Jabber, Manager Business Development at UIN, and your host for today. UIN has been working with our community around institutional structures for external engagement, trying to answer questions such as, which part of the university should be responsible for external engagement? Do we need centralized or decentralized approaches? How do we set up a front door for external engagement? And how do we create internal alignment and communication? To help get this conversation going, we have invited for this episode, Gregory Harper, Business Development Director at the University of Melbourne, Cindy Mahler, Director of University Innovation at Boeing, and Brandon Schneider, Manager of Project Affairs at University of California, Berkeley, who will provide their insights into different ways of structuring external engagement units from both university and industry perspectives. We hope you will enjoy the discussion. I've asked uh, each of the panelists to uh, introduce how things work in their own organization. So we'll use that as a baseline to just uh, get a bit of uh, an understanding. And then, of course, we'll follow up with questions uh, and a bit of discussion. Uh, Greg, I might ask you to go first. Hey, look, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thanks, everybody, for joining us wherever you might be. What I wanted to do was just give you a sense of what we're doing at the University of Melbourne around industry engagement. And I'll, I'll start with a pretty high level view because then we can drill down further. I need to acknowledge the, the great training that we've been getting from the University Industry Innovation Network in the last couple of months, which, which has given us all a chance to step back from the day-to-day -day grind of our work and think more strategically about where we might go in the future. So thanks, Sarah. So my role in the university is I'm a business development director, which means I work primarily at the faculty level, but I have another role, which is across university, looking at agriculture and food technology. So a bit of a, an industry sector focus. I thought the best way to look at this is come right from the top. It, it really needs to have a clear strategic element. And in the university's case, this is our strategic plan, which is called Advancing Melbourne 2030, where industry engagement, commercialisation, creation of, of uh, community impact are clearly identified and characterised so that while within a university environment, there's many definitions of impact, the um, led by Vice Chancellor Duncan Maskell, we, we've got a much clearer idea of the role of commercialisation in the broader impact picture. Now, strategy will never work without people and incentives for those people. So the, the university is putting in place an accelerated innovation and commercialization program, which is very much around position description, that's what PDs are, differentiated incentives, as well as sanctions for behavior such as uncontrolled conflict of interest. And I, I think that there is always in this commercial sector a, a, a balance of um, risk and reward. Structures are important, clearly, and structures follow strategy. And it's important to note at a university like ourselves, which is a large-scale, comprehensive university, there needs to be this activity linked to faculties. Faculties is where the, the bright academics are managed in an intellectual sense, so that they're maintaining standards and focusing in the right areas. But there's also some work around cross-faculty and outward-looking activities. And you heard me talk about, I'm a, a business development director in the context of a faculty, but also with an outlook looking role in an industry sector. Lifelong training, I think, is important. And again, the, the UIN work is important with a real focus on on the job because we're recognising now how difficult it is to get people to come into these types of ranks and think in the long term about a career in aspects of commercialisation innovation. I think that something I valued a lot is a clear statement of organisational risk tolerance. At the end of the day, we are a university. There are certain objectives. We're not a venture capital fund, for example, so we don't have those styles of risks built into our system. And there need to be, I guess that's where 
where the sanctions come in. There need to be some clear comments about, no, that activity represents too much risk, you know, come back a little bit from there. And then finally, the a point that a lot of energy needs to go into alignment between the university and partners and clear statements. So, Sarah, I'll leave it there. I hope that's high enough, but deep enough as well. Thank you, Greg. I think uh, a lot of uh, topics to unpack in there. So thank you for that. Maybe, Cindy, can I ask you to go next and talk a bit around uh, Boeing? Absolutely. So just really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today, or <laughs> whatever today may be. Last year, as Sarah mentioned, we undertook at Boeing a benchmarking study to evaluate how we were engaging with universities when it comes to sponsor type research and PhD recruiting. And and through that, I had an opportunity to, to meet with many industries, not just companies in aerospace, but industries to get feedback and insight into changes that could be made. So we did all this really awesome stuff. And at the end of the day, we decided to make some changes at Boeing. And that was, we rebranded our strategic technical university program, which had been sitting in our research and technology organization for 18 years. We rebranded it a university partner engagement to be, once again, more holistic right? And not just focus on the research and the, the recruiting at the PhD level, but connecting with other parts of the company for all our university engagement when it comes to HR, engineering people strategy. So focusing on our undergrad recruiting strategies, upskilling our own workforce, helping to influence curriculum um, at universities, and, and much more. It's a many-pronged process or model that we've embraced. Now, with that said, at the R&D level, which I'm responsible for, we also clearly defined our selection criteria for why would we work with a specific school or what are the factors for success? And I think Gregory just mentioned this, but relationships is key. Relationships is everything to having successful partnerships with universities from an industry standpoint and vice versa. So what we do at Boeing is um, we ended up having a centralized um, portion at the top where I am, a uh, university innovation sits in the enterprise technology office. We are responsible for 15 to 20 relationships with universities in our portfolio. And then we have a decentralized process where we tell our teams, right, that our team can go do research with any university that meets their needs. And once again, that helps us stay really focused and strategic at one level, but be tactical or transactional at another level and have a mix all throughout. The strategic level that I'm responsible for, we really are looking for future needs, right? So we have four enterprise priorities for the future of capabilities we want to develop. And then there's technical capabilities that align to all of those. So we get a small bucket of funding to be able to try and stand up capabilities in those areas. But at the end of the day, it still goes back to it's all about those relationships, right? So be developing and getting to know your university counterparts. So real quickly, I'll just share that. But, um, each of our universities, I have an innovation lead assigned to them that are in the portfolio. That innovation lead then has a regular rhythm with their counterpart at the university. For us, we love it, right? Like, we love it when there's a front door and there's someone there who can work with us and help shepherd us through the university, you know, for different contact areas. Not everybody's set up that way. And universities like it on the flip side, right, that they can go to one person. And so when it's centralized at my ETO level, it's, it's set up really easy for that. It gets harder to get into Boeing at the decentralized level, right? Because now it's scattered everywhere if you don't know where the needs are. And so that's once again, where it goes back to being so relationship intensive. One last thing I'll mention, and, and then I'll get off the stage, is a few years ago, we set up a graduate researcher program. So this is a 10 to 12 week work experience um, in the US predominantly, where we do bring in interns at the, grad, at the PhD level to come experience what it is like to work at that. We love this opportunity, right? So it's a small group of students, but we get to focus on what their talents are, what they're getting their PhD in, align them with similar type research or work happening in the company that can broaden their experience base. And for us, it doesn't matter. I mean, we would love to hire them when they graduate, right? But some students want to be professors, right, and work in academia afterwards. And once again, it goes back to that relationship building, right? Building those relationships and they're building relationships with other students in the program from different universities that's going to be part of their network going forward. 
I mentioned a lot about our U.S. program. We are working on specific regional strategies around the globe, knowing that, you know, we don't want to mimic or replicate what's in the U.S., but playing off of the strengths of each region. So I could go on forever, but I'll stop there for you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, really interesting. And I think uh, as well, lots of lots of follow up questions. So thank you for that. Uh, Brandon, can I can I ask you to talk a bit around uh, UC Berkeley? Yeah, I'm going to share a couple bullets uh, momentarily. But I want to preface that by letting everyone know I may be coming from a perspective that is complementary to where Greg and Cindy are coming from, in the sense that my office, which I'll discuss in, in greater detail momentarily, its primary objective is to create campus-wide sponsorship relationships at UC Berkeley. Those can include different components. It can be philanthropy, it can be internship, recruitment, hiring, etc., we're working to develop research and development connections, but it's primarily, we might almost be an industry partner that's looking to go beyond R&D. Our R&D folks come to us to build out the relationship and seek out further connections. So I wanna be clear that we have an R&D relationship and that innovation component, we have connections to that part of the university, but our wheelhouse are these campus-wide sponsorship relationships. So let me walk through what I mean. There's 20 different divisions on campus, 30 different units, who knows how many. Berkeley's a giant fragmented campus. Different units are all looking for corporate engagement. Um, it can be philanthropy, it can be sponsorship like our unit. There's several R&D opportunities, either specifically centralized units looking for commercialized intellectual property. What our unit does is collate these different primarily sponsorship opportunities into a package for potential sponsors. Those relationships involve this corporate partner coming to Berkeley, going through a vetting process, there's an RFP process, there's bids, et cetera, going through a process that includes campus working groups, which are stakeholders drawn from, there might be an R&D rep, there could be a student life rep, there could be a career center rep, there's the sustainability lead for campus. The working groups vet these opportunities. If approved, they go up to an advisory committee of senior campus leaders. This could be the director of HR. It could be the vice chancellor of research, the chancellor herself, ultimately. Senior leadership vets these opportunities. Once we get to final sign off, we move into implementation of a relationship that will be built around sponsorship. So that could mean Clorox promoting itself at a football game, but also Pepsi providing uh, scholarships for disadvantaged youth as part of its relationship with campus. It could involve an insurance company sponsoring a clean technology program on campus, developing clean tech. It could involve me helping to coordinate a data sharing arrangement between faculty members and a financial partner to analyze consumer behavior. So the core element is sponsorship. I think that's where I differ from Greg and Cindy in this approach, but we have connections. We have relationships, both formal, informal throughout campus, and our job is to kind of develop these holistic relationships. Quick sidebar, we are also developing more localized relationships, so not campus-wide, not the same scope, not covering the entire campus, with an individual unit where we're trying to do two things. Generate revenue for that unit, either through philanthropy, through R&D, through sponsorship, but also in a sense, trying to teach the unit how to develop its own business relationships. That's a longer haul. It's a longer story. There's various variables that make that challenging, but we have that twofold scope, campus-wide sponsorship relationships and these kind of more targeted local relationships that could be philanthropy, they could be R&D, they could be hiring, et cetera. Great, thank you, Brandon. Uh... Again, interesting, um, interesting approach. And I actually wanted, um, I had a few other uh, questions specific maybe to, to the approach that you take, but maybe just uh, generally for, for all of you. So thank you for sharing, uh, for sharing those insights. I'd like to maybe start with something that uh, Greg said, which is a strategy lead structure. So I'm very curious how that works uh, across uh, your different institutions. So what role does having a lead, maybe committed leadership or uh, the right strategy in place drive the, the corresponding structures and then activities that you would undertake? Uh, let me have a go there. So um, strategy driving structures. So in, in the context of a comprehensive university and one that's really focused on innovation, so we accept that it is a thousand flowers bloom. 
often great ideas that will make change in community will come from all sorts of places. So at the university level, it's very much about identifying the types of things that we will celebrate, that we will indeed be seeing commercial engagement as a key part of what we do, but that can occur in the context of a listed global corporate or indeed an impactful non-government organisation working in the regions. All sorts of different models can be accommodated. One of the things that I, I'll just mention is that in Australia's context, we have these other structures that allow very focused work. And I'll just mention in our circumstance, we have things that are called cooperative research centres. So where there is a strategic element that government or the community wants to see developed. And I worked in one, for example, that was for the red meat industry. And this was about developing, you know, stronger genomic tools and better ways of marketing uh, red meat products globally. So in that case, very clear strategic element. And then we created structures to collaborate around that. So not something that the entire university would be interested in, but on the other hand, not as narrow as Brandon was doing a typology there that included a, a, a narrower group type response. So still nationwide, still cross universities, cross industry, but with a, a structure that reflected that particular goal. And, and I think there's a strength in that structure and from a single university point of view, value in the way we um, engage with that newly emergent structure. And if there's anything that might be a, both a strength and a weakness in Australia is that where the strength is, we're really happy to generate new structures that, that follow particular goals, that's a weakness in itself because <laughs> it, it creates complexity for some of the um, longer term entities that we work in. Thanks. Uh, Cindy or Brandon, do you want to add to that from your perspectives? I can share from our industry perspective, um, you know, being able to pivot like we did this past year was um, part of that was developing what is the strategy? Why do we engage with universities and what are the objectives of that engagement and being very clear um, on the goals that, that we would like to derive from the relationships. And as a result of that, we were very successful, right? There was an appetite within our company to be able to make change and do that holistic connection points or integration across the company to better position ourselves um, for the future. And, and, and the future is all already here in the sense of, I don't know how familiar you guys are, are, but in aerospace, you know, recently I saw something that there's 200,000 job openings in aerospace right now. And it's hard to fill all of these positions. And, and that is going to continue in the future. And so when so many companies are vying for top talent, how do you build those relationships with the campuses? How do you continue your strategic work for those technical goals of the future, like sustainability or disruptive mobility, you know, once again, in, in aerospace language and there's so many pieces that come to it. So your strategy has to be able to pull you pull you all together. But at the end of the day, right, it's the structures that help you to go execute and build those relationships to make it happen. I would say in our case, overall campus strategy informs the values and the standards and the resources that go into the type of revenue generation that we do. Any specific opportunity is really driven in the immediate sense by particular business needs. So for example, um, in partnering with Clorox, I think Canvas identified it was spending X amount of dollars in, in disinfecting and cleaning. And it's an opportunity that if we're going to be spending that type of procurement money, supply chain money, we could also couple that with sponsorship money, potentially develop an R&D relationship, potentially develop a hiring relationship. Clorox, in our particular case, is close to the Bay Area. It's a local company for us. Um, so there's Campus value, camp, overall campus strategy high level informs the values and standards of our partnership process. It also determines resources. My unit, all things considered on our campus is fairly well resourced and it's not revenue dependent. Our budget is, it is what it is. If we bring in $100 million, if we bring in $10, that's, that's our budget. Um, but then in the specific opportunities, it depends on the immediate opportunity or business need. Um, at which often we go through to RFP. So that's kind of our, our structural relationship to overall campus strategy. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. On, on that, when you talked about resources, I was just also wondering how big is your team? 
We have approximately four and a half full-time employees. So we have four full-time employees and then a, an executive assistant who shares her time between different units, about 25% of her time with us, and two interns. And that's divided up between an executive director who sets the overall vision, strategy, and, re, and maintains the highest level relationships, a communications manager who handles everything from making a deck to the vision for the communications and the marketing and branding relationship with the corporate partner. We have what's called an activation manager whose job it is to ensure that the marketing and sponsorship and contractual obligations happen and happen well and make it easy for the campus partner to execute on those. And then I'm more or less a project slash relationship manager slash business development officer, meaning I help coordinate and manage the new development opportunities through category working groups, through RFEs, this ad hoc partnership services relationships we're developing. I coordinate that, make that happen, make sure it runs smoothly. I'm our team's representative through the negotiating and contracting process with the executive director. And then I have an overall responsibility to make the business aspects of the relationship go well, meaning that Pepsi, for example, has a marketing relationship with campus, but it's also providing products to our dining services. I'm not on the ground, but I'm a troubleshooter. I'm a fixer. I'm a, okay, there's a problem. Here's how we're going to address it type person on the business aspects of those relationships. So we have about four, four full-time staff, two interns, and an executive assistant. Yeah, there are different roles you described. We, uh, we use the term boundary spanner as a, to describe a lot of these professional roles where you're really spanning the boundary between the university and the external environment. That, that explains our roles, our roles very well. Yeah. Uh, Greg, your research, innovation, commercialization is a fairly big team. How many, how many staff are there? Give me the opportunity to quickly calculate it <laughs> because obviously all of these folks are not under me, but let's think about them in the context of the uh, research, innovation, commercialization under executive director Ken Jefford. So people with these boundaries spanning type roles, as you define, I think the number is probably 50 and the research and innovation commercialization group itself is bigger than that because it includes people who have roles in pre-award for grants, post-award in terms of grant funding, as well as research integrity and ethics group. So if I just talk about the, the 50 that are in the boundary spanning role, they are broken up into a group that focuses more on faculties, and that's the group I'm part of. So they work on faculties, they work in uh, industry sectors to bring opportunities forward and to, to work with the investor community. A second group really works across university and outward looking, across government, across large corporate opportunities. So the, the bigger deals, if you like, the more uh, strategic long-term, some of the ones that really Brandon was describing. And then indeed, in terms of research precincts and Sarah and others, you'll know about Melbourne Connect, which is a new precinct opportunity that's being developed where we bring partners in, bring them very close to the university and and work with those relationships using a client advisory manager type role, a CAM role. I thought what was really interesting for a contrast and comparison was thinking about why Brandon had a role that included other components like sponsorship, like, for example, philanthropy and recruitment. It, it's within the University of Melbourne, those roles are, are separated out. So we have a, a group called Advancement that looks after uh, donor relations, but the, the, the key there, going back to the relationships core, is if you have people who are very experienced, having had global roles in aspects of philanthropy or advancement, then we bring them close to the people that might have more experience in, um, in corporate engagement or engagement with government. And each, at least in our circumstance, each of those things is quite differentiated. I, I often think, having worked across the Australian innovation system, that they're quite tribal in, in the way that they look at different components of the innovation system. And our challenge is always to, to step out into those different groups and, and speak a different language um, about the way you might engage with the university. Thanks. Thanks. And, and Greg, I think uh, the situation, I mean, University of Melbourne is a very large institution. And I think that's reflected in the, the size of the team, which many other universities would be a lot, a lot smaller. Uh, Cindy, what about how, how is it with you? How big is your team? So the core team is a team of four um, who are kind of the managers of the overall strategy and the portfolios. And then we have people matrix to us <laughs> from across the organization. So um, I mentioned earlier, we have innovation leads, we have contract support, we have finance support, even when we 
when the statement of works get written, right? We have supplier requirements engineering, right? Who help us make sure the salads are written just perfectly. And then, you know, it grows wider than that. Um, we have work with HR. We work on the giving side of our organization. It's called Boeing Global Engagement for the giving. I'll just use the word giving, um, you know, and how that aligns to universities. We work with Boeing resource groups as well and external technical affiliations. So we're aligned through those mechanisms. Currently, we're working on improving our HBCU strategy in the United States, for example, and making sure that we're aligned through different organizations in understanding the needs of the HBCUs so that if, if and when we do go approach them, right, that, that we show up and we can support in a way they need to be supported. Great. Thank you. Uh, you also mentioned about the like having this front door uh, with universities and how that's a feature you really appreciate when you're engaging with a university. I'm just wondering, and this is a question to all of you, do you think that uh, this, you know, one-stop shop uh, front door approach, is that kind of like the, the golden star? Is this something that uh, all institutions should be aiming towards when it comes to external engagement? I think it would be ideal to have something like that. And in theory, in some contexts, my office is supposed to be something like that. What I found it's very difficult to do because of the various expertise you need um, to, to navigate all the different elements. So when I mentioned our office primarily does sponsorship, but it also includes these other potential components, we really are a connector and a navigator in a sense for corporate partners. At least my goal is to try to make the university easy for them to understand because it certainly isn't. It's super complex. It's, you know, it would, I could be here for hours explaining the organizational structure at Berkeley. So at our job, trying to be the front porch, I'm not sure we're always successful is saying, okay, you want to do this? This is our wheelhouse. We're experts. If you want to include this, I can also connect you to this person, or I can be the initial liaison to get that conversation started or take us down this path. I always have to rely on colleagues to finish those other areas. I'm not going to be the person that's going to write a gift agreement. I'm not the ultimate R&D person. I facilitate the relationship. And so our office has that goal of being that front porch. There are certain aspects we're very good at. Others we're working to improve, and it's simply a matter of bandwidth and lack of, of being able to be an expert in everything all yeah. at once. Have our, our specialties are we complement each other, but we can't know everything, and so that's why we rely on on our colleagues. I think uh, just uh, sorry, Cindy, before you before you jump in, I think you when you said um, your navigators, connectors, I think you really touched on a, a very key point because it's not necessarily about knowing everything uh, or all the knowledge residing with one person, but rather knowing how to navigate uh, within the complex uh, ecosystem of the institution. That's crucial. And I, I was just going to validate that, <laughs> that statement, right? It's having somebody hold your hand, essentially, um, for how to make those connections within the university and how to navigate the processes. Yeah, I absolutely support that comment and picking up on some of the words Cindy's used, which is like the, she's matrixed in to a whole range of other folks. I think that's really important. And to navigate, you know, for somebody coming externally to navigate through that matrix to the key node points, that that's what the complexity is. I should just reflect on the fact that for some of our external investors who might be more experienced in working globally, they're very keen to go across the front porch fast. They might know exactly who they're interested in connecting with. They might have already met them in some other context. And they, they recognize that, as Brandon has said, that they're the role for folks like us in making sure that there's quality and values and standards continue to be met. But insofar as those are going to be met, these high net worth individuals want to find particular individual researchers that they're interested in connecting for the long term. Often they're interested in connecting with a, a bright researcher all the way from early postdoc years through to retirement. We see this very much from industries. Industries will want to to look at the university and say, well, that there's a, there's a generation there of people that we would like to interact with. And we recognize that the generations will pass and our organization will, will stay connected. And Sarah, I was reflecting on one of the relationships that UIIN has been talking about, which is the relationship, I think, with, with Siemens and uh, universities. You know, these are 30 year relationships. So it's, it's, there's front porch folks, but there's generations of front porch folks who, who effectively have passed the relationship from one to another and need to respect the long-term nature of that, um, you know, in an economic and sort of university and large global corporate perspective. 
definitely <laughs> uh, one thing I've no, I've heard from all three of you so far, and it, it resonates a lot with uh, the work we do and what we preach is that it really in the end it's about people and relationships, and how do you have you know how do you maintain uh, those relationships regardless maybe of you know what kind of structure you may have uh, within your institution. I wholeheartedly endorse that. I think that's absolutely true. That's been my experience as well. And what I wanted to add to the current conversation is that also I find the opposite, for lack of a better word, is also true. And it can be challenging for us sometimes working with companies when we want to develop a holistic, broad relationship. The people we are working with immediately are often business development professionals, uh, sponsorship or marketing folks. And because these are often large corporations, it's also difficult for them to navigate their own side of the equation and make the appropriate connections. So one of the challenges we face is kind of almost learning the company's internal structure so we can maybe prod or hint, um, you know, could you mention this to this person or things of that nature to try to build out this relationship. We also have to do our homework and find that it's a challenge with the companies we work with for them to make the internal connections to build the relationship beyond, in our case, sponsorship and marketing to R&D, to HR, to recruitment, et cetera. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion. Stay tuned for the next episode on the Strategic Partnerships podcast series. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify and LinkedIn and sign up for our podcast newsletter at uiin.org.